Okay, folks, I'm here at the Lenaway County Historical Museum Auditorium. I'm going to show you something really cool. Lenaway rocks the 60s presentation. You just stand around and listen, and I'm going to show it to you. My name's The Raven. Standing up here in the beautiful, beautiful auditorium of the Adrian Historical Museum building. Used to be a Carnegie Library. I made a movie here for you once. All the music that you hear is guys from Illinois County, uh, either writing or singing. Matthew Gray, Wild Bill, Hesitation, Royal Culture. All of it. You heard that? You heard that? Oh, really? Oh, Steve Briggs. That's what I do, Jordy. <laughs> There's a couple of my friends right there. Live long and prosper. Yeah. Have a good time, y'all. You bet.
say is, I probably will use the mic. Lots of people here for the presentation today, folks. Check this out. When the call goes out in Adrian, they come. To a very, very unique auditorium here in Adrian, Michigan. This is the auditorium at the Historical Museum. Nothing short of fabulous. Check out this old period dress right here, folks. I mean, I love that thing. One of these days, I'm gonna get my gals to dress up in some stuff like that. I'm gonna get me a top hat and some period gear. I'm gonna walk down the street with my gals looking like that. Just for the heck of it. <laughs> Some old camera gear at the History Museum.
looking forward to that. April 18th, tentatively. So, I know you're looking forward to today's program, and we're pleased to have John Cushel here uh, presenting it for us. Uh, John came to us uh, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago. He has a historic house here in Adrian and came down to the museum to learn more about it, and he never left. <laughs> <laughs> so that was to our, certainly to our and the museum's benefit because he's been a tremendous help with not only learning about from his own house, but moving on to help others learn about their historic house here in Adrian and, and Lenawee County, as well as helping those who wanted to learn something about their family history. So we're just glad he could do that, but while he was here, he happened to come across a lot of photos and information about band groups and, and <coughs> music people here in the county back in the 60s and such. And so that fired up his interest. He's always been interested in music. And since he was news director in the 70s at local WABJ radio, he's got a lot of connection to that sort of thing. So all those years there at WABJ, then he followed that up with 31 years teaching in Toledo. So we're glad he's back here in Adrian to, to work with us. And the subject has really taken off in popularity. He's done a couple of previous programs that have been well attended and lots of interest. And so we're just glad that uh, he can do it again. And uh, he's enriched the program a lot over the last year, you'll see from the slides and such. So hope you enjoy it. Let's all go back to the 60s when music was the best. <laughs> share in common, I imagine, the most, of, the most of you is we still represent the biggest chunk of the population, the baby boomers. And uh, from, if you're born between 1945 and 1955, you are in that category. And uh, rock and roll started during our reign, so to speak. Uh, it had a rough start. Parents didn't like it. Churches thought it was evil music. Even Congress got into it with the payola scandal, but yet we survived. And what happened in Lenawee County happened in every county in the United States. Uh, all Everybody had garage bands and what have you. But Lenawee County was special because of the number of bands that eventually uh, took part and entertained us Friday and Saturday nights. Uh, this particular presentation tonight is going to be strictly before the Beatles, because before the Beatles there were probably only 10 or a dozen bands that were actually rock and roll bands. After the Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan uh, in February of 64, Rex Aldridge sold a lot of guitars after that. And the bands just shot up. And, and subsequently, a lot of venues uh, were started. Uh, I asked a question a teaser last night on what the three biggest venues were in Lunaway County during the 60s, and uh, maybe I'll ask that question later. I think we'll all get it. But let's get into the program right now. Um, it, it lasts about an hour, so relax. Hopefully you can see the screen. But uh, it all basically started with this, this guy. 3.30, uh, we came home, and if you were lucky enough to have the in charge of the television, you turned on Channel 7 in Adrian, out of my hometown, Detroit, and you saw this guy, Dick Clark. Yeah. And Dick Clark played the, the latest hits, but I think mostly you girls were watching whoever your favorite dancer was, who she was dancing with that day, and what new moves she was coming up with that you can practice at home so you can take it to the pavilion or the armory. So, sure. This is the guy that introduced us to rock and roll at home. And then, because it was such a 
you know, merchants figured, well, this rock and roll thing is going to make me some money. So radio and television stations continued on. And then we had this guy out of Detroit. This is Dale Young, uh, who had a show called Detroit Bandstand that followed right after American Bandstand. And he had Dale Young and the regulars. Now, some of you from Devil's Lake in 59, like Margarita, probably knew Dale Young because he was at the Devil's Lake Pavilion quite a bit in 1959. Uh, but that was a show out of Detroit. And then later on in the decade, we had this guy. And uh, I know Rick Oscarelli knows him. This is uh, Robin Seymour. And he had a show uh, on CKLW in Detroit, Channel 9. I guess it was Channel 9 in the But Swinging Time was a, a show that featured not only national acts that came through the Detroit area, but he also opened up to a lot of uh, local groups. Consider, uh, the Hesitations were on. Don Sweet, although I understand from Ellie Pipkins, Don Sweet would move around a lot. And in television, you know, you're supposed to stay in the spot. <coughs> if you've ever seen Alex Trebek moving people around, you know, so Don Sweet was all over the stage. So Ellie Pipkins said half the time he wasn't even on camera. And then a couple years after that, Adrian's own Royal Coachman were on. Rip Coscarell is here with us today. And uh, so that was called Swinging Time. But the thing that Robin Seymour is holding in his hand was very important to us. I'm sure a lot of you had a case like this. Kept our records in here. Oh, Tom Dog by Elvis. Um, and then we had a little record player. Actually, I had one that only played 45s. It had a big spindle and what have you. But we would, after the American Bandstand was off, we would go up in our room and play our records. So. Where did we get our records? Well, one place was Nixon Marlboro's. This was an ad that was in the 1959 newspaper. Nixon Marlboro's also sold band instruments and, and, and things of that nature. But you could go there. They ran an ad every week in the newspaper. And the, this is 1959. Mac the Knife was the biggest seller at Nixon Marlboro's. If you were in Tecumseh, you went to Eggleston's Jewelry. Now, why did Eggleston's Jewelry sell records? Well, because they were going to make some money on it, because that's the way it was going. If you bought 10 records, you got the 11th one free, Eggleston's Jewelry. Uh, in Blissfield, a hardware store sold records. Western Auto, I don't even know where it was, but uh, this is 1960. They had an ad in their local paper. So the 45 was very important to us. It was so important to me that in Detroit, I ended up buying an in-car record player. <laughs> and for 45, the Boxsters in Adrian, this was apparently a car group that I noticed on growing up in Adrian. I love that website. Uh, and notice the guys here. <laughs> DA, right? So there were a lot of car clubs, so it was important for guys, and usually they had a really good sound system. This record right here, you notice, it's a 45, right? <coughs> See the address, 1056 Vine Street, Adrian, Michigan. <laughs> this was the group called the Symbolis. And the uh, owner of this house was a gentleman by the name of Whitey Spiegel. And you may have known him as quite a bowler. He, was a con he worked at the concession stand at Bunaway Rec way back in the 50s and 60s. His real job was at Stubby's. And he was one of those guys that probably had a cigar in his mouth, saw a young band and said, hey, kid, I'm going to make you a star. <laughs> and the first he had, actually, he owned this name, the Symbolics. So there were four different Symbolic names. Uh, the first group was, uh, well, we'll talk about that in a second. But this song was Crazy Tom. <clears throat> it's by Tommy Armstrong. And the writer, you can't really read it, but it's Mac Pickery. It was produced by a gentleman called Bill Victor. And Bill Victor is this gentleman. He worked at WABJ in 1959, just passing through as a lot of uh, DJs did, and moved up. His boss was a guy you might have heard of him, Phil Donahue. <laughs> Phil Donahue was the program director at that time. And Bill Victor recorded this song, you know, uh, at the studios at WABJ when they just moved from, remember when they were on Treat in 223? 
<clears throat> they moved downtown. Mr. Garrity uh, owned the Commercial Bank downtown, and he moved when Commercial Bank moved out behind Cunningham's. That was the first studios of WABJ, and that's where that was recorded. Bill Victor was only in town for 10 months, but he managed to do this record. He also managed to marry a Kapnick, Elmer's brother's daughter. And uh, matter of fact, his granddaughter and daughter still live in Avery, Michigan. Unfortunately, he got a job up in St. Ignace in about 1970, and his snowmobile went through the ice on Lake Michigan and uh, died very early. But he was important in rock and roll because when I came to WABJ in 71, we did not play rock and roll. Mr. Garrity hated rock and roll. I don't know how these guys did it in 59, but fortunately they did. Uh, this is one of the first DJs to come to Lenaway County's, Ron Knowles from CKLW. He was, he was kind of their swing guy, you know, fill in, vacation dude. Because again, there were not enough bands to play at all the places that kids wanted to dance to. That's why they were called record house. There was no bands, it was just playing. And then if you happen to play in a gymnasium at a school, you know where sock, sock hops come from, right? Because the principal would come in and said, take off those shoes, and that's why sock hops came. This is my favorite DJ, Tom Clay. Just threw him up there just because I, I really liked him. Uh, this gentleman is Joe Van. And Joe Van was another CKLW uh, DJ who was, didn't have a regular shift, and if he did, it was at midnight. He became very close with a couple of bands here in Adrian, one being the Deltinos. Anybody heard of Cub Coda? Cub Coda was with the Brownsville station in the 70s, smoking in the boys' room. Well, they, they were a band out of Manchester, and uh, he played their record on CKLW. I think the record sold like 300 copies or something. But Joe Van also met a group of guys from Adrian as in Celine. And one of the guys, maybe Rick here, Rick Coscarelli is with us. You can see where he is, right there. There's Rick. Hold it up. A, a tambourine and a saxophone. That's interesting. Uh, they were the exiles then. And I don't know, was it you, Rick, that went up to the, or one of the guys went up to Joe Van, and he said, what do you think of our band? Joe Van said, there's 100 bands like you in Michigan. They're all dressed the same way. You need a gimmick. No. And, and this was the gimmick. They became the Royal Coachman. Where did you get that stage, that, that coach? That was up in the Irish Hills. Irish Hills, okay. And they got all the suits. I think there was a lot of sewing going on in households uh, through Adrian. And so they became the Royal Coachman. And it's due to Joe Van's influence on that uh, situation. As I told you, a, a lot of bands were not performing at a lot of hops. It was just record hops. And here's an example of that record hop at the Eagles Hall on the main street next to where uh, the telegram is. Now this is, a, anybody know what this is? Where is that? That's Larry Cycles, right? Larry uh, actually bought this in 1973. This is a very interesting building. It's one of the oldest stores in, in Adrian. It's on South Winter. Uh, that porch, by the way, is original. It, it was first a funeral home. It has been the headquarters of the KKK for four years in, in the early 30s. It was the Social Security office. It was the draft board. It was the first adult senior center where they used to play uh, croquet, uh, not croquet, shuffleboard on the uh, top floor. But the back of the floor, well, and let me tell you about the basement. Larry thinks it was a speakeasy because there was a full equipped bar on the bottom with a lot of secret doors. But this building is important to today's presentation because two guys met here, and they were Mac Vickery and Wild Bill Emerson. They were at, in 1957, when Mac was just out of high school and Wild Bill had just moved to Adrian, they didn't know each other. They were practicing for a talent show put on by the Union. It was the Union Hall at that time. And Mac approached Wild Bill because he heard how good he was in the corner practicing and said, let's join together and win this prize. And they did, and they ended up playing for the next seven or eight years. So this is where Wild Bill and Mac Vickery met and continued on with their career. 
Now, does anybody know what this is? Well, you are eating, if you are Friday night on South Winter Street and you're like the 30th person in line waiting for a table, what, what restaurant am I talking about? The Grasshopper, right? This is the third floor of the Grasshopper. The armory was built in 1925, is that about right, 1925? Before that, this was the armory, it was the armory block. And you'll, you'll notice the stage over here, okay? All right, and so there's a lot of buildings in downtown Adrian have stages because there were a lot of organizations that would do self-entertainment and, you know, talent shows or what have you. So there are a lot of stages on the upper floors of, of Adrian businesses. Well, this is the way it looks now. Steve Rosales, who is now the manager at the Grasshopper, took me upstairs. This is the third floor. This was taken last week. And uh, a lot of uh, Hispanic bands played up here. There was a lot of, what's that 15-year-old uh, quinceanera? Or they, you know, a, lot of, a lot of events went on. There's nothing on there now. Second floor of the Grasshopper, by the way, is rentals. But this is, it's a beautiful stage. Uh, the lighting wasn't very good that day, but that's where some bands played uh, in the 60s. Okay, as I said, there were very few bands of notoriety in Adrian and Lenawee County in the 50s and 60s, but this was one guy. Does anybody know who this is? Graduated in 1958, <coughs> nickname was Tex. Under, this is a yearbook picture and it says, what is he interested in? Cars, girls, and music. You might know him better as this guy, Jack Quigley. This is Jack Quigley. He headed a band called Jack and the Jaguars back in 1958. And he was the first Cymbala band. His, his group, uh, Jack and the Jaguars, uh, Milton, uh, Whitey Spiegel allowed them to rehearse there. And this is Jack Quigley's graduation picture. Jack Quigley uh, left us in the fall from leukemia. I did have a chance to talk to him. He said when he went away to college immediately after graduation in 58, he walked out the door to Eastern Michigan, I believe. He had a suitcase and his guitar case. His dad yelled at him, leave the guitar home. You're done with that. And that was the end of his career. And a lot of bands did end at high school. I think the Royal Coachman thought they would be done at high school until uh, they got jobs at frat houses and played all over the state. So this is Jack Quigley, and this was, he was always a good cop and an excellent shooter. He won a lot of awards uh, for that. The next band is a guy that graduated from Madison High School in 1960. His name is Riley Watkins. And he's really not that small. It's just the guy next to him is really tall, Paul Garrison. <laughs> this is Riley. They were called the imprints at that time. This is Paul Garrison. This is Riley's brother. This is a very tall saxophonist. I forget his name. And this is Ron Simmons, who is the vocalist. And they played as the imprints. This is the second group of symbols. And this, these are the guys that recorded the record that I showed you earlier. Some of you may know this guy, Stan House from Tecumseh, whose mother is more famous. She was Babe House, who played uh, a lot of uh, clubs around uh, Lunaway County until she was 85 years old. This is Elmer Van Loon. These three guys were from Monroe and Dundee because they were fortunate. Their parents had uh, cottages up near the lakes. And this is uh, Dick Macon from Adrian. So that was the Cymbalas, and they performed a lot at the uh, pavilion. That is on the stage. I'm sure Margarita recognizes that at the, at the pavilion. This is the El Dorados. I believe this gentleman is Warren Keith. Does anybody remember Warren Keith? <coughs> Keyboardist that graduated the same year that Mac did, played a little bit with Mac. But when, uh, these guys were from Pontiac. They played at the pavilion. Uh, there were like three groups in 1959 that played there a lot. This was a rather uh, interesting gentleman. He impersonated uh, Tep, uh, impersonated Elvis Presley. His name was Tep Wicker, but uh, this was the El Dorados. This is Warren Keith in Adrian and when he was 15 years old. Handsome guy in front of his favorite instrument, the piano. And uh, that was Warren Keith. He ended up 
without a job in the early 70s, and, and Mac Vickery was down in Nashville working with uh, Hank Williams Jr. And Hank Williams Jr. at that time was doing like, like his dad stuff. And Mac is one of the people that said, you know, Junior, you have your own talent. Why don't you start your own band and do your own stuff? And he said, I, I know of a keyboard player up north, uh, Warren Keith. So Warren Keith played with Hank Williams Jr. for a number of years. These are young men of migrant fathers who worked in the Ridgeway and Britain area, and they played a lot in uh, Tecumseh rock and roll. They were called the Rivieras. And then this is sort of the same group, a smaller group called the Blue Angels. And I don't know if any of you remember this guy, but this is a very, very young Ernie Sanchez. And he played keyboard for a number of years. Uh, they, they, they were called the Blue Angels. Now these guys were like the first garage band, I suppose. And they are called the Hesitations. You might remember Don Abels from Adrian and Ellie Pipkin. And they would challenge each other on their guitar skills, sort of like dueling banjos, but they were like dueling guitars. They answered an ad from this guy in Tecumseh, Don Sweet, and they formed the Hesitations with Larry Chase and Larry Mack and Ellie. The guy in the middle is their manager from uh, Manchester, Chuck King, I believe. Uh, their, their suits were gold. And even Ellie told me that they painted their shoes gold. And they performed in, uh, around the state for many, many years. Uh, but they were based out of both Adrian and Tecumseh. See, so you think Adrian and Tecumseh can't get together? That proves it. This is a gentleman who graduated about 1961 and probably made the most money in the music field of anybody out of Lunaway County. His name is Bob Wilson. Bob Wilson's brother started Wilson's Barbershop. Um, I believe, I can't remember his name, but Bob <coughs> lived on what was called Henry Street, which is now Siena Heights Drive. He was one of the few rockers back then that actually knew how to read music because his mother forced him to take piano lessons with this lady. Anybody remember Mrs. Standish? Five foot four with a, a long, yardstick that whacked you if you didn't do good. Yeah, she was a real tiny, but Bob Wilson credits her for his success in music on the piano. Now, radio uh, advertising was expensive, even back then. I mean, bands didn't make that much money, so they couldn't afford ads in the newspaper a lot of times. So even though I researched a lot of the newspapers for ads, that didn't mean that there were not other dances. Bob and the Invaders, that's Bob Wilson's band, in 1962 used this method, which is the poster. That and a nail and a, and a utility pole, that's all you need, right, or a storefront. Or word of mouth, or pamphlets. But advertisements in the newspaper were expensive, and you know that would cut into their profits. This is the first ad that I could find in my research of a, a rock band in a, this is 1957. Uh, Saturday, December 14th, maybe you were there, at the Skate Arena, which is now called the Adrian Skatery on North M52. And uh, Matt Pickery, just fresh back from Memphis, where he cut a couple of demos for Sun Records, and Sun Records had guys like Jeremy Lee Lewis, Johnny Cash, um, Perkins, and some guy named Alvis. Um, but anyway, that was where the first advertised place, Skate Arena. Now, roller rinks were really popular back then. And I gotta ask you guys, did you just, did you dance on skates? Or did you, okay, you danced on skates. So, all right. This is the inside, I believe, another uh, growing up at Adrian picture, thank you. This is the inside of the Skate Arena many, many years ago. Now, you've heard of this place, right across from the wigwam where the Palmyra racetrack is. Uh, I don't have a picture. If anybody has a picture of the Hilltop Skating Race, that'd be great. It burned down in the mid-60s, I think. But this is where you entered the rink. Uh, there is a counter. Uh, the, a couple of these, they were really good skaters. I can't recall their name. You sat down and probably paid your admission. And then how did you get to the rink? Does anybody remember? Yes. You walked downstairs in your skates. I hope they had a good lawyer. Uh, 
But anyway, you went to the basement of this place, and that was where the roller rink was, was in the basement. They've been in. Matt Vickery and all the guys used to play there, too. Uh, there was uh, one, it was the, uh, was a hill hillside, right? It was called the spinning wheel for a while. I don't know what happened there, but the Cymbalas just recorded that record that I showed you way back, and uh, they were, that was it. They built up, too. Then this place is out near the lakes. This at that time was called Wonder Grove. It had a number of different, I guess it was just called the, the Devil's Lake Skating Ring. And it was outdoors. Uh, I believe the tornado took care of this in the mid 60s and now it, there's a housing development. Somebody told me this morning though that there's still some remnants of the actual ring. Then in certain communities in Lunaway County, we had what were called teen clubs. Tecumseh had one, Blissfield, Addison, Berenci, and Clinton. Now I believe Adrian's was in the junior high at, uh, at the high school, I mean at the junior high on Church Street. The noon dances, and I don't know too much about that, but uh, these were teen clubs that they could dance and, and you know play records and, and sometimes have bands in there. Okay. Now, I asked yesterday, what were the three most popular sites for rock and roll in Longway County in the 60s? Anybody have any guesses? Well, this is one. What were the other two, do you know? Armory and, and Walker's yeah. Law. Yeah. Those were the three. Well, Frankie Avalon came in 1959. Sunday, July 5th, two big shows. I understand the attendance wasn't that great that day, but there was only one reporter that did any story about it, and she's in the audience today. There's her name down here. Her dad ran a marina. Thank you very much. And this is a picture, I don't know who took, did you take the picture? No. No? Okay. And uh, this is him at the stage. You can tell that's the typical uh, oval there of the stage. That's Frankie Avalon. And Marguerite they interviewed him at Devil's Lake. Um, this is the guy that ran the place, Pokey Green, from Seneca, Michigan. I don't know if a lot of you know it, but his younger brother ran the Seneca Pavilion. He also was a car mechanic. And even though Pokey didn't like rock and roll, he liked money. And uh, he was a big he was a big band guy, but. In 55, when he bought it, bands, big bands were going down in popularity. And he, uh, he bought the, the pavilion and, and stuck with it. He was, he was a very hard guy. He was a taskmaster. Uh, the, the Rationals had a, had a promoter called Jeeps Howard, a uh, Howard. And he didn't have his shirt tucked in, and he kicked him out of the pavilion. That was in the late 60s. Some people, some people thought he had the, the dressing room, which was real small, uh, bugged, and uh, if there was any talk that he didn't appreciate, the bouncers would come in and, and let him know. But Pokey ran that place and made, uh, made it a fun place for kids to go to. Um, this is the way that area looked in like the 30s and 40s. This is, I believe, the pavilion right here, right? And then this was the hotel. So back in those days, I'm going to head to the next picture. This is the interior of the way when Pokey bought it in '55. You'll notice the sides are open. You could actually park your cars out there and listen to the music. But so, but because it was not a winter, it was only open in the summer, and any winter performances were at the hotel. But then, unfortunately, in 1963, maybe there was a fire. The old pavilion went down and Pokey had a decision to make and he made this one. Uh, he built this, which was a rather simple one. I want you to look carefully. This only lasted a year because this happened. And we all know about the tornado. The tornado and that wiped that pavilion, which was less than a year old, uh, away. And the night before this tornado, there were probably a thousand kids there at a concert, so it was fortunate it happened when it did, if it had to happen at all. Pokey had another decision to make, building number three, and he did. It looks a lot different, but you notice the front 
was a entranceway, and I believe the bigger part is in the back where the dance hall was. This is when you entered the club. There was a game room that was new, and I believe, if, <coughs> if I'm correct, then you walk this way between those doors to get to the dance hall. And so that was the pavilion, entertained thousands of kids in the 60s. He had, a, he had uh, this is his competition, though, up north in Alley's Resort. And this is Alley. He didn't like rock and roll either. Uh, he, he was a little younger than Pokey, but he still liked big band. But Wamplers had to, you know, compete. This is, uh, this is uh, Mr. Luckhart, Alley Luckhart, the same guy you saw before. This is right after 2000, uh, the year 2000, and just before this was demolished. This is where the pavilion was, and below, I believe, Alley had a, a, a bar, a regular bar, which had a sign saying, no guitars allowed. So, uh, Bob Seeger said this is the most rickety place he ever played. Uh, and obviously it didn't last much longer than 2000. This is the stage of Wamplers. This is the third Symbolist group. And, uh, how did I get that? Okay, uh, and this is on stage at, this is Gary Olette, Dickie Price, I don't know this gentleman's name, I think it's Foster. Johnny Hart on the keyboard, and Kenny Spiegel, who was uh, the manager's son. This is at, on stage at Wampers. Now, a lot of competition between Greens and Alleys in the mid-60s, mid and newspaper ads are expensive, and these are almost half-page ads, but see how they're fighting? I'm sure Pokey was mad that Alleys got on top of them on this one, but uh, they, these were huge ads because of so much competition between those two clubs. Uh, this is the next uh, venue I said that was popular was the Adrian Armory. And uh, this is back in 1959 with, uh, it was called a show called the Bandstand USA and the Grand Rock and Roll Opry. And so the Armory was run by this particular young man, Paul Hill, uh, who was the manager of the Armory, and it's really great to see the Armory right now being revamped. Mark Murray's doing a wonderful job. If you haven't been there, you gotta go. It, it's, it's just, it's wonderful. But Paul Hill ran that, that club, uh, and there are a lot of other activities that went on other than dances, but it was a very hopping place back then. There's another place on US 12 that is called uh, Frontier City. And we used to take our kids there and pretend they were cowboys. But they had a place back here, if you see the cursor. And they had Sunday afternoons at, uh, at Frontier City. They would host Grand Ole Opry artists. And they were never advertised in the Telegram. It was odd. It was the Brooklyn Exponent or Jackson. But this guy came in August of 68, Johnny Cash. And by this time, he was a huge star. 5,600 people. I gotta believe this is the biggest audience that ever watched a rock or a, a musician in Lenawee County. 5,600 people. And of course, later on, Frontier City was purchased by Cedar Point because Cedar Point was thinking of putting another amusement park because of the, the success of the MIS. But I think Cambridge Township uh, residents and officials had enough of the traffic, so they nixed the Cedar Point project. And uh, as a matter of fact, to this day, Cedar Point owns a lot of that property. This, now I, I mentioned there was a 45 that was made in, in Lenawee County. Pete Drake, who was a slide guitar player, he's right here. And he was a, mostly a country western guy. He actually recorded an album from Frontier City. And I bet this is the only album that has Onstead, Michigan on the front. <laughs> and you, you can get, this isn't on like a major label, but it's still available on YouTube. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to hear a song that you never thought you'd hear, go to YouTube. They've got it all. They, I, I, it's amazing. So this was an album recorded at Frontier City. Oh, we all know what this is. But unfortunately, you know, I look back for rock and roll, in the 60s, they didn't do a lot of rock and roll in the 60s. Not till Riley came, Riley Watkins in 69. But this is the Wigwam right across from the hilltop. And this is later because there's only two TPs left. I think they started with five. In the old days, 
the bar was located within between the, uh, the teepees. Later on, they built a, an actual bar. Uh, the one thing that is interesting about this picture <coughs> is there's really no activity or fight going on. <laughs> and, above, and above the bartender, it says, no profane language allowed. <laughs> right. So that was the teepee town, which, I mean, excuse me, wigwam, which eventually became the teepee town. And Bob Butler played out there with uh, Bob Butler and the DJs. Um, okay. This is an Adrian right now. Tell me where this is. It's on, okay, I'll tell you, it's on North Main Street. <laughs> Bolvian Chiropractor. Mm -hmm. In 1964, Mark Murray's parents, Dr. Murray and his wife, uh, he was a dentist in, in Tecumseh, purchased this building to make it a coffee house long before Starbucks. And he, both he, he and his wife were in theater. They were uh, in, in summer theater in Tecumseh and the Irish Hills. So he bought this to feature rock, not rock, but uh, folk uh, artists and poetry, you know, sort of like beatnik stuff. And this is the interior of the club in 1965. These kids are sitting on the floor, and they're like these table floors, and they were they were being served uh, drinks that were mocha and things of that nature when you didn't have a lot of that stuff around. And these young ladies were just filling in that night. This is uh, Cindy Kidd and Sarah Freely. Um, uh, yeah, back in 19, whatever, I'm going to say here. Uh, but 1965 or 64. And so Mark Murray remembers when he was probably 10 years old helping his parents out clean out this building. He told me that one of the artists that came here, this is amazing, they would come in on Wednesday or Thursday because the big venues that they played at were in Detroit or Chicago, and these kids wanted to make a little money, uh, extra money, so they played at smaller venues like Lenoir County. And the Murrays would actually have these artists come and stay at their home uh, south of uh, of Tecumseh and you know feed him breakfast that way they didn't have to get a, a motel room. So he has a poster of this young Canadian folkster who was passing through and he and I said well who's that and he said Neil Young. <laughs> Neil, and I, I, I can't wait to see that poster. So Neil Young came to Adrian before Buffalo Springfield before Crosby Stills Nash. So uh, we do have some interest in that. This club didn't only last for a couple of years, and but yeah, it was another venue where a lot of teenagers obviously had a good time. This was another club I put on Facebook the other day, uh, growing up in Adrian, tell me your memories of this, and really nobody has a lot. This was a club that's, remember where Leonard Amusement was? Right across from Larry Ackley's? Uh, it was a Coco Club. Jenny Jenkins, who was a Katarina, I believe, she uh, purchased this club and managed it for a couple of years, but it was another venue where teenagers could dance while Bill Emerson was playing that weekend. It, it, it lasted for a couple of years, but another example. Then you had other places around Lunaway County, the North Shore Inn, I don't even know where that is. Uh, is that still in existence? Yeah, it is, yeah, it's okay. Uh, okay, this is an interesting, this is, this was rented out by Gallant Motors. It was the worst decision they ever made. This was on North Main. So these people called it Hippie Haven. And the neighbors didn't like it too much. And you can't read the sign, but it says, Gallant said, we do not own this property. <laughs> it only lasted for about six months. I don't know if any music was going on there, but I'm sure something was going on there. Uh, that Hippie Haven, but God bless. Five bucks the psychedelic music. All right, I'm going to let this stand up for a while. And well, how significant is this to Lunaway County? Read carefully. The most important percentage in your life, 3.2. Lunaway County is fortunately located on the border of Ohio. And Ohio is like I used to come to Toledo from Detroit on 75 with my buddies and head down uh, to Toledo because 3.2 is a big thing. It was 21 drinking age in Michigan, 3-2, even though 
I guess you would call it near here now, was an attraction. And there were a lot of clubs in Ohio where we went to and bands played at. You may have heard of the Marauders. Uh, they played at the Hideaway in Berkey. It's now it was called Dave's Place. Chuck, you remember that, don't you? Yeah, I bet you do. <laughs> Drove home. Uh, but the Marauders were these. This is part of the Marauders. The only guy missing here is Gary Olette, who I showed earlier. This is Albert Reed, fantastic guitar player. Uh, Steve Moore out of Tecumseh, and this is Ernie Sanchez again. I don't know why he's got a guitar, because he's a keyboardist, but I guess he looks cool. But anyway, this is the Marauders. They were very popular. They even won a Battle of the Band contest in Toledo, where there was lots of competition. This is a place where Mac Vickery played a lot in East Toledo. In the mid-60s, they changed their name to the Club Cato. Does anybody know what it was named before that? This was T-Bones. T-Bones was on East Toledo. You would get there by crossing the bridge, and then suddenly you'd be in East Toledo. Mac Vickery owned this place. They loved him down there. Uh, that was T-Bones. The, this was, might be a place that some of you went to, the Peppermint Club in downtown Toledo. This is a book that is, well, I've got it right now, but the library, I, I had them buy this. This is me, uh, old DJ in, in uh, Toledo, put this book together, and all it is is a series of ads. I wish I could do that, make the book a lot easier, but it's really nice, and it is available. It shows all the Toledo nightclubs and basically just showing the ads, and a, a few pictures, too. Okay, you all know who that is, right? Mac Vickery. Uh, Mac Vickery, of course, moved down south in 1965 to uh, pave a way to Nashville to become a country western, not singer, what he always wanted to be, but a writer, and he turned into be quite a writer. Mac Vickery came back to visit his children. I assume this is the, is this the wall of the cross, what do you think, maybe, John? I have no idea. Yeah, well, it's downtown. And this is one, if you hear a lot of people saying, well, their memories of rock and roll in the 60s, they talk about the street dances. And this is an example of one of them. I like these three guys in the back. <laughs> All dressed together. But anyway, there were a number of street dances that were held in Adrian in various locations. Maiden Lane, behind Gordon's, over behind Kresge's. You know, uh, uh, so Ray Moxie who was retired uh, recreation director for Adrian, came into Adrian in 65. I said, I didn't see a lot of ads for these in the paper. And he said, we didn't need to. Word of mouth was enough. Plus, he said, ads cost money. So there were a lot of street dances downtown, even in Tecumseh. This is looking, uh, this is where Harvey's got his pharmacy now. But this is looking east down West Chicago Boulevard during a Battle of the Bands contest during sidewalk sale days. Remember sidewalk sale days? And this is an interesting band. This is an all-girl band. They got tired of guys getting all the accolades. There are four girls from Tecumseh, or five, that started a band. They were all members of the marching band, and they formed a group called the Inverted Order. So good for them. And then Dawn Patrol, which was at Myers Airport. Rock and roll became so successful in the mid-'60s that every event you had, you had to have a rock and roll band. And I think that's carried on to this day. Um, they were even on, the a and opened up a, a, a little place in Bluesfield, probably where McDonald's is now. And this band that turned in to be King Richard, and this is the Chevrons, actually played on top of the building <laughs> to a dance in the parking lot. Uh, Rick Isley is probably the note, uh, most noted player in that group. But again, uh, and um, so then the Beatles came. The Beatles came and Sky Drive-In, you know, they couldn't get enough of that. So they needled the Beatles show. They showed four features of all about insects. <laughs> and then it said the Beatles come to town. Well, they didn't come to town. There actually was a newsreel that they played between, uh, between the movies. But that's, everything changed when the Beatles came. Uh, Why Bill Emerson remembers him playing on top of the concession stand at the Sky Drive-In. And everybody knows where the sky was. It's where Coles is now. All right. We're going to talk a little bit about this because, you know, bands only, and we only danced, what, on Friday and Saturday nights, maybe Sunday sometime. 
but there was always Monday through Thursday. And you will probably find not only Adrian musicians here, but the entire county's musicians came to this place, Aldridge Music. Aldridge Music was where these guys <coughs> found their skills, testing each other, stealing each other's licks, stealing each other's band members. Uh, they all played there. And the last guy to leave at night was usually Ralph Dun uh, Ralph. Ralph, uh, yeah, Duff. he was the last guy because Rex Aldridge had to kick him out. This is the owner, June, right? Yes. Yeah. Rex and June Aldridge. Rex was a great guy. He worked at Nixon Railroads in the early 60s. He saw rock and roll was going to go somewhere. So he started ordering all these guitars. Well, Nixon Railroads had oboes, pianos, and finally Nixon tells them, or Marlboro's, or one of them said, we got no more room for these guitars. So what did Rex do? He took them home. And his son David's here, and his brother, basically had to move out of their bedroom and move in the garage where the guitars moved inside because you couldn't keep them in the weather, right? <laughs> so for a couple of years there, the Aldridge home actually stored the guitars. And then Mr. Nixon fronted Rex a good sum of money and said, why don't you start your own store? There was no, there was no anger or anything. He just said, start your own store. And that's where Rex Aldridge uh, ended up putting his, uh, his iconic, I, it's got to be iconic, because I tell you, every musician I spoke with, oh yeah, we hung, at, we hung out at Aldridge's music. And his son to this day is still selling music online. Uh, but, but Rex Aldridge, just a great guy. Let me tell you one other story about Rex. You remember Jerry Lee Lewis? Jerry Lee Lewis, with a whole lot of shaking going on, played at the Armory one night. And, you know, he always would play, I'm going to get off point here for a second. He would play the song, a whole lot of shaking going on. It would start real slow, right? And then when he got into it, he stood up, kicked his bench back. Well, there was a band from Adrian or Tecumseh backing him up that night. The bench went right through this kid's new amplifier. <laughs> Tore it up. He's like that. Immediately, well, you know, uh, Jerry Lee whips out his load of money that he had, and he's like, oh, kid, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Anyway, Paul Hill steps up at the, at the armory and says, yeah, we got a show here. Somebody called Rex on the phone at home, probably a Friday night, said, we need an amplifier. Rex ran down to the store, got an amplifier, was back at the, uh, the armory in 15 minutes. So not only was he a great guy, he was like the triple A of musicians. So uh, Rex and June all had. And I guess he didn't like his picture taken much, so it's great that the museum has this in our archives. All right, another big, big rumor that I've heard, and I, I really didn't believe it at the beginning, but somebody said, oh, I remember when Stevie Wonder came to Adrian. Ladies and gentlemen, Stevie Wonder never came to Adrian. <laughs> and if you did see him at a street dance, it was Ralph Dudley. <laughs> that, and, you know, and Ralph was like 10. But you see this ad, this was in a Friday paper of the Telegram. He's here tonight in person, fabulous recording star Stevie Wonder, plus whoever these people are, the sensational sandstorms. A dance contest, we're going to give away a stereo albums, don't miss it tonight at the Armory at 8 o'clock. Now first of all, it was the only ad put in. If you're going to bring Stevie Wonder to town, you probably have ads like two weeks ahead announcing it. First of all, Barry Gordy never let his artists go out independently. They were always the Motown Review. He watched his, his, his uh, bands and the Supremes like a hawk. So there was never any independent thing. Well, anyway, he, at 8 o'clock, Stevie Wonder didn't show up. So the promoter from Ypsilanti got up and said, he'll be here, his flight just came in at Willow Run, and he'll be here in a second. 9 o'clock, Stevie Wonder didn't show up. Promoter got up, said, he'll be here in just a second. I just, just heard from him. That promoter left the back door of the armory, got in his car, and took off with all the proceeds. Oh. He never showed up. He never showed up. And of course, Sunday, it's, you know, so I'm, okay, so there's got to be something about this in the paper. So 
Back then, they didn't have a Sunday telegram. So this was the headlines in Monday's paper. Little Stevie didn't make it, and his Adrian fans protest. Not only did they protest, I guess they got a little rowdy, too. There was some, I'm going to get off this so you don't read the names. <laughs> but there were a couple of kids arrested. There were, you know, a couple of windows broken. You know, all stuff that was carried over. But the fact of the matter is, he never appeared in Adrian, and this is Ralph Dudley, probably how he looked back then. Uh, Ralph was a dancer with his brothers. They were called the Premiers, and they would go to street dances and dance behind bands, and the bands actually liked them because they were doing a little show while they were playing the music. Ralph eventually became, as I said, he learned to play all the instruments at Aldridge's. He eventually played music. It's now on the West Coast. You see him a lot. He loves Adrian, and uh, he kind of does a one-man show on the West Coast. Now, there was another, you remember Freddie Cannon? Freddie Boom Boom Cannon, Palisades Park? Uh, Holiday Club, Beecher and Treat, right? We apologize to the public for the incident that involved the misrepresentation of Mr. <coughs> Freddie Cannon. Notice the spelling, Freddie. Freddie Cannon with Palisades Park is F-R-E-D-D-I-E. -E. Apparently this guy showed up with a ukulele and a harmonica. <laughs> I don't know how we got there out alive at the Holiday Club because that was a rough crowd. But anyway, the Holiday Club puts this ad in the newspaper the next day and said, we didn't know anything about it. And I don't think the Holiday Club booked another band after that. So there was a lot of, you know, people were taking advantage of the situation back then. Uh, then there were some odd places that had bands. We talked about the Seneca Pavilion. The, uh, the Ogden, I, you know, Odd Fellows had a dance. They didn't know who they were going to get, but they were going to get some orchestra. <laughs> now, Margarita, you might help me out on this. I want you to read below Cascade Gardens. I don't even know where Cascade is. So coming in person, Vion and the Belmonts. Okay, what's wrong with that? Well, it was Dion and the Belmonts. And I didn't even know he came to this area. But he was at the, do you know where the Cascade Gardens was? No. It was located next to the golf course. Remember the tower used to be there? And then I think it was around there. But anyway, they had Vion and the Belmonts, uh, which obviously was wrong. So there were a lot of, Mistakes made in ads, either it was a bad phone line or a poor speller of the telegram. This is the one that was later on. Dance at Green's Pavilion Saturday. Okay, that's fine. Then you get down here. Again, a band probably playing bigger venues at Detroit and Chicago on the weekend, so Pokey signed them up for a Wednesday performance. They were the Electric Brooms. <laughs> Who's ever heard of the Electric Brooms? Right? Well, maybe they were talking about this band. <laughs> who had the song, yeah, I had too much to uh, dream last night, okay. So anyway, there were a lot of, a lot of mistakes made, but and they're, they're just fun. Uh, pretty much, that ends what I want to talk about today. If some of you would like to linger and chat with me, if you can't and you have a story you would like to share, please sign the book, put your contact information, and I will get to you so I can make the book even longer. Uh, about the book, I can finally start, because I'm going to turn these presentations down. This might be the last one. I've got to start writing it, because if I don't, it, it, it's, it's going to take forever. So hopefully we'll have it done by next year. It will be available at the museum. Mark Murray has allowed us to, or talked to me and said he would open up his place to have a reception. Maybe we can get guys like Riley Watkins and Don Abel's to come up, and wouldn't that be a fun time? And Ron Jeffries and all the rest. And then they can mix with the young guys like Gordy Sharp, who still plays to this day. And again, I told Gordy before, I'm pretty much stopping in the mid-60s, because after 65, the bands, wow, we just have a lot of them. But they were important as well. And somebody said, why don't you go into the 70s? And I said, well, because it's called Lutaway Rock, the 60s. And pretty much by the 70s, there was this event that went on in Jackson called Goose Lake, and that pretty much changed the venues, and Pokey's place was too small now, and these, they, they, they needed bigger venues. And we had bands that were very committed to playing, and they still do to this day, Gordy still plays, 
and I'm sure you, you should support your local musicians. But again, I want to thank you. I'm overwhelmed by the people that have been excited by this passion that I have, and uh, it's, it's important to me, but it's a lot of fun as well. So thank you very much for attending. Uh, there's refreshments in the back. Please stay if you want to. I am now going to put this in the slideshow, and there are pictures that you didn't see, so I will do that right now. Uh, and if you need any information on who these people are, uh, just let me know. Thank you very much. Almost live from Fraser Auditorium in the Adrian Historical Museum building. My name is The Raven. You're watching GlobalWorldTV.com. Yeah, I know, that was awesome. That's, 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 that's,